I over delivered to every single person that bought my program. And then they told people, and then my programs grew by grassroots instead of me putting all of this into social media. I said, you know what? I post multiple videos a week to the people paying for my program, not online to my potential clients. So I probably put 90% of my effort into the people that are paying me and 10% into growing my business. And that has come back, you know, tenfold. What's up, fitness fans? Welcome back to the Future of Fitness podcast and interview series. This is your host, Eric Malzone, and this is episode number 85. And it was a bunch of fun to talk to Sarah Duval. So, um, why is this episode important to you? Well, first of all, Sarah has built an impressive online business and she has really carved out a specific niche. And I'll let her explain what that niche is. Um, niche, niche, I still go back and forth on that. Um, but the point is, you know, it took her five years uh, to build a business. And I think when a lot of people get into the online space, they think it's gonna be maybe easier than the in-person or brick and mortar uh, style of business, but it oftentimes takes quite a bit longer to get your voice heard. And I know this because uh, I do it on a daily basis. And um, you know, I can contrast both uh, models, but, but Sarah's done it swimmingly. She is highly successful. And uh, I know um, having a lot of conversations with her that she's only gonna grow uh, her business probably double within the next few years. So take what you can from this. There's a lot of very, very actionable items and insightful and inspirational and all those things. So, um, and it's a lot of fun. She's a good person. And before I get into that, I just, I have to talk to you about the fitness accelerator. So, you know, after all of these podcast uh, interviews about 350 now to date and uh, everybody within the fitness industry, all interviews within the fitness profession. And, you know, there's some specific things that I see um, that I want to make an impact and, and help change. And the biggest thing is that we have an industry that is very siloed. And what I mean by that is that, you know, people within a specific area or specialty, like say CrossFit, uh, they talk to CrossFitters, um, and that's all they do. They kind of stay within the silo, the same information bounces around and we want to help bridge those gaps, uh, do some cross pollination, uh, for lack of a better term, and uh, and start sharing ideas. So we've uh, we've introduced the Fitness Accelerator. It's an online community. Um, you can check it out. Go to fitnessprofessionalonline.com forward slash fitness accelerator. Uh, you'll find people like Sarah Duval, for instance, um, very successful people in that group. And we're all sharing ideas. We're sharing insights. It's equal parts uh, incubator, mastermind group, and networking group. And it's the best $147 a month that you could possibly spend Trust me on this. It's the best value out there. So go check it out. It's fitnessprofessionalonline.com forward slash fit accelerator and uh, get two weeks on me. We're doing two week free trials right now. So risk free two weeks, get in, make some introductions, see what it's all about and uh, really enjoy the experience and just accelerate the growth of your business and the industry overall. So it is fitnessprofessionalonline.com forward slash fit accelerator. And with that, number 85, Sarah Duval on to the show. Dr. Sarah Duval, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I think our, our listeners are, are going to get a lot out of this. And uh, let's do this. Um, let's kick it off with just, you know, kind of give a, a synopsis of your story through health and fitness, because I think that's important in the background. Then we'll get into, you know, kind of the nitty gritty of, of what you're currently doing, which is really, really cool. Okay. So back to what drove me into this profession um, from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. So I started out at the age of 11 as a candy striper at the hospital, worked on the cancer floor. Uh -huh. <laughs> I knew I wanted to help people for a living after that. I loved, mm -hmm. you just, you, you love brightening somebody's day. You know, there's absolutely nothing that can replace that feeling being able to help people. Um, but I couldn't handle all of the death that surrounded the, the cancer ward as amazing as being able to help those people as amazing as it was. So I found the physical therapy wing and that was like, Oh, okay, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 99% of the people here are getting better and I'm helping them get better and that I could handle. Um, so I fell in love with physical therapy at, at the age of 14, um, well before I was, you know, an athlete per se in the athlete world. And then that just solidified it as I pursued sports and I ran track for Clemson University and 
mm-hmm. with a sponsor keg order after college and just managed to get myself hurt a lot. So it's good, good for fashion choice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, um, you know, personal anecdote, I got my, I thought for a while I want to be a firefighter. So I had to go get my EMT <clears throat> and towards the end of the EMT, you have to get certain hours, um, in, in the ambulance. Right. And I happen to be mm-hmm. in the one where, uh, we would take, um, cancer patients to chemo and then we would pick them up again. And that was such like, I mean, it was only, I only did that for like four or five hours. Right. But it was such a, a powerful, like, wow, life is really yeah. fragile. Cause you get these incredibly energetic, happy, talkative people and you bring them to, and then you, you brought them back out and it was just, it was hard. It was tough, you know, but, um, you know, I realized that you know, there's so much more to, um, you know, care or helping people than just like, the nuts and bolts of like, um, you know, what medications, what movements we to do, but just the caring aspect of it. And I think you probably tapped into that at a very, very early age. The, the psych side, I, I don't know. Sometimes I find it almost more important than the exercise prescription side. Yeah. Yeah. We're learning that with pain science. I mean, pain science is incredible. What we're learning that you can give somebody something completely random that has no basis and shouldn't help them. But if they believe in it, mm-hmm. then they get better. I mean, pain science, is just, it, it blows everything that we think we know yeah. <laughs> out of the water, which, you know, I, I sometimes I think is very scary to a patient who wants this perfect you know, this is going to fix me. It's like, well, you know, the body is very complicated and we don't understand it a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, when you talk about that, like, um, pain care and things like, is that, are you, are you talking about like placebos and how that rolls in, into, into there's, play? There's, yeah, I mean, it's, there's placebo and then there's also just nerve pain. There's rewiring how we're connecting to, um, the pain and connecting to different parts of our body and how we're perceiving it. I mean, that's, it gets, it's complicated, but it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So, um, so you're, you're, tell us about your practice. Like how has that evolved? You know, after school, um, you got your PT and, and how has that evolved? Because it's, it's a really interesting story to get to where you are now. Uh, I know because I also interview you guys can check out, um, Sarah's interview on the fitness blitz as well. It's a shorter form, but let's, let's dive a little deeper into that journey because it's interesting to me. Oh, thanks. Well, I, um, I started a personal training in college. So, you know, I ran track for Clemson when I was home in the college, home from college for the summer, I worked as a personal trainer at the Y. So, you know, help people go through the Nautilus equipment and show them how to set it up. Uh, so that was, that was my first introduction into personal training. So it was just a whole lot of, I want to lose weight and then, you know, how can I get stronger? Uh, so I continued to personal train through undergrad and then through physical therapy school. And that was invaluable because I would learn something in the classroom and then I would step into my side job that was paying for school and apply it. So I thought that was always a really neat application for PT school and something that I wish more people got the opportunity to do because you take ortho one your first year and then you wait four years to apply it. And so I think it's, it's kind of neat to apply it as you go through. Um, yeah. So I had that personal training background because I've always just loved fitness and athletics and movement. Um, and then I opened my own practice in Charleston, South Carolina, and had kind of a hybrid out-of-pocket pay physical therapy, but I also had personal trainer and a Pilates uh, instructor working for me. And that was really fun. I felt like we were able to meet the needs of people who wanted physical therapy, but then also wanted to continue on and work with someone that was a little more highly specialized. And that's kind of where I offer continuing education. Uh, it kind of bridges that gap between physical therapy and personal training. So it's more on the corrective exercise side. Um, then we moved around a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I sold that practice, opened another one, <laughs> left that town, opened another one. Then I'm finally like, okay, I'm starting an online business. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know? So let's, let's talk about that because you, you have uh, really carved out a specific niche, niche, niche. Um, what do you say? Do you say niche or you say niche? Uh, it depends on who I'm talking to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I go back and forth every day. Um, so I anyway. I can't say Colorado, right? <laughs> Colorado. How do people say it from Nevada, <laughs> Nevada, Nevada? That's always a tough one too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so let's talk about that. Like, what what is the niche that that you have really found yourself in, and how did you get there? Did you plan getting there, or is it something that 
that just comes I out. plan to go online. I, we were talking about writing a book earlier. I've written an entire back pain book, but it's sitting there on the computer. <laughs> so I've always treated mostly back pain, SI joint, um, chronic pain, technical, because when you're out of pocket pay, you're generally the fourth physical therapist that somebody goes to see in the last resort. So it yeah. always involved lots of outside the box thinking and outside the box practice. Um, but then I had babies and there was not uh, enough resources for me to figure out how to navigate my own postpartum rehab. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a couple uh, pelvic floor physical therapists that didn't help me. I was very disappointed. Uh, They're amazing pelvic floor PTs out there and amazing PTs. I just didn't happen to see them. And me being the ortho, I dove into research. Um, as I was telling you, I'm married to a scientist. So yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a really great for being able to also grab some access through him at the time. So I was like, okay, I have every journal I could possibly want to read. <laughs> and so I dove in and read every study I could on the pelvic floor and started putting the pieces together. And I just felt like women should be able to get back to CrossFit or be able to get back to rock climbing or be able to get back to, you know, whatever high intensity sport they want to do after injuries from birth. And I really do think that a lot of times having a baby is, should be treated like an injury, not just, um, this specific part of life. So I kind of fell into it because I needed it and there wasn't enough uh, help for me out there. Interesting. So, um, so what was the first step? Did you, did you just start working with patients? Did you like know that you were going to go online immediately? Did you like how? Well, my first step was to read everything I could. Okay. And All right. A bunch of classes. Yeah. <laughs> did some of the pelvic floor physical therapy coursework through Evidence in Motion. And I still pay the head um, person there, the head course creator for the pelvic floor PT program once a month for a mentor session where I overload her with questions. I think having mentors is incredibly important. Um, so I meet with her once a month, like, okay, what about this? What about this scenario? Let me talk you through this. And so we troubleshoot. And, and that's, I just think that's invaluable to have somebody like that, that you admire to bounce ideas off of. Um, so yeah, so I researched and I learned, and then I started applying it to patients after myself. I always love to feel things on myself. I'm like, oh, that's a new exercise for the serratus. Okay, let me see how it feels. Let me see the troubleshooting. I mean, because of physical therapists and trainers that don't work out, I feel like they're missing this huge piece of the puzzle for being able to, to feel and describe things. Um, yeah, and then I started working with women. I hosted a couple of free uh, courses for local women here. And then from there, built my postpartum clientele. Um, and the stuff worked. And I got people well. And I was like, all right, I think I'm ready to share this with the world. And then that's how the online program came about. Oh, interesting. And over like, like when did this start? When it was that? I think you said like five years ago. Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. Right around five, four and a half, almost five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that, um, <clears throat> you know, we were talking a little before this and, you know, I, I talked to, obviously I talked to a ton, a ton of fitness professionals. You do. Um, <laughs> a lot. A lot. And, uh, you know, I will all the time, you know, they all, everybody wants to get into online coaching, you know, and that's, um, <clears throat> And, you know, it's only a matter of time if it hasn't hit already before that's completely just saturated, right? Everybody offers online coaching because the systems are getting better, right? Um, you can get trainerized, you can get exercise.com, you can get Fitbot, you can get all these tools. Um, but so rarely do I see people um, approach it the right way first. Like, you know, first that everybody starts broad, right? And they're like, yeah. okay, I will help anybody. And then they end up helping nobody. Right. But if they start narrow um, and then maybe think about it like, okay, I'm going to build this over five because they all want it now. Right. Everybody wants it now. They want 50. And I was telling you, I worked for a full year, a full year online. I mean, I was seeing people and making some money in person, but right. I worked for a full year writing blog posts and building my website and even mm -hmm. you know, offering stuff and without making it done for an entire year. Yeah. One year. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah. And that's the hard part, right? Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, I mean, you can, you I mean, I'm sure people can do it faster than me. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. Like you ask, I mean, you know, Tony Gentlecore, um, you know, I've had him on the show and, uh, you know, I have pleasure working with him too, um, pretty regularly. And all the time he gets asked the question, like, hi, hey, how do I get a successful blog? He's like, mm -hmm. well, start writing. Start. And then <laughs> Keep doing. call me in 10 years. 
And that's kind of what, you know. So speaking of mentors, I love Tony. So we moved to Boston. I was like, oh my gosh, I have all these resources right here. Right. And so I paid for a session with Tony online. And then I sent him an email and I said, hi, I want to talk business. Because this was back when I was fairly new. Um, things were just, you know, they were just kicking off, but I was figuring out how to scale. And I was like, okay, I need to talk through ideas with somebody. I need some, you know, to bounce some ideas off of. Things are starting to take off. I want to, I want to do this right. And so I emailed him and I was like, okay, here's what I want from your time. And he refunded my money. And I was like, no, Tony. <laughs> so we agreed a place to me. I paid him again before the meeting. I was like, don't you dare refund it. I value your time. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Tony. Yeah, know, it does. He's such a nice guy. And then we uh, we sat down in the coffee shop, and I asked him this long list of questions, and um, you know, felt good about it because I I respected his time, and I wanted to pay him for it. And so I think if you're wanting ideas from people, just book a session. Yeah, I don't even just book a session. Then send them an email. Say, hey, this is what I'm asking questions about. Like, don't hesitate. Don't be afraid. Um, yeah. For the money, for the value, I've gotten a whole lot out of connecting with people. Um, when I was first starting and that's such a great way. And then he's like, well, why don't you write an article for me? I'm like, great. And then that made some connections and then, you know, it, it pays to connect with people. And, and if you need to book a session to connect with them and feel good about it, not like, Oh, I'm going to pick your brain. Cause that's, that's always, that's not the way to approach people. <laughs> don't send him an email and say, Hey, I'd like to pick your brain. Can you give me hours of your time when you're a full-time working mother of two? Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, oh, that's great. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, don't don't so yeah, it's a good point. And I think um, what you what you did that's different than most in that approach was just the the um, the authenticity or the transparency that came through up front. Right. Like I, mm -hmm. I started working with you know one of my first mentors when I wanted to get my online coaching or remote coaching, whatever you want to call it going, I, I hired one of who I thought was one of the best. Right? I hired him myself. And that's another thing. It's like you want to get online coaching, hire somebody. Right. Um, so you can be on that that client end and see how the systems work, and and then hopefully somebody who's good um, <clears throat> and cares. And you know, I just told him very upfront, I'm like, hey, I obviously I want to be coached. You know, I want to be a better CrossFitter, um, but what I really want to do is just learn how to be a coach. You know, mm -hmm. and once that was set, that was that was obviously the the intention of all of our meetings moving forward. He was very gracious. James Fitzgerald was very gracious with his time and, and still yeah. is actually, I just call him up and he'll just meet. But I think that, that having that upfront conversation and being very clear um, with that is really important too. Yeah, no. And, and I definitely respect people that want to learn and I want to help them. I have a continuing education program for trainers. I want them to know what I know. I want to help more people. And to me, the more I can help educate people, the more people I can help yeah. from it, you yeah. know, it's, it's, I don't have the secret formulas where I'm like, Oh, I'm keeping them to myself and keeping them secret. I'm like, here, learn everything I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'll package it for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see how many people we can help. Let's see how many lives we can change. Let's see how many, you know, how many women where we can completely rock their world because now we give them so much hope and so many options. Yeah. I love that. How many women can we completely rock their world? So let's get into like, how do you actually do it? Like, what are the, what are the tools? You mentioned you have a course, I believe it's, it's CU credits, right? Continuing education. Um, well, if you're at that point where you're trying to decide how, where do I host my online programs? Because that was a big one for me in the beginning. Like, mm -hmm. could you kind of host stuff on YouTube or Vimeo and, and do links or, you know, host it on your website. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to have to worry about this thing crashing in the middle of the night. So mm -hmm. I went with Kajabi. You probably heard of Kajabi. Yep. Uh, and I have been nothing but completely happy with their uh, course hosting and checkout platform. And I never have to worry about it crashing in the middle of the night. And that's easy, like a drag and drop feature. Um, so that's what I use for my online courses. Okay. Okay. So let me, I, I want to go back a little bit because so you did a year of content, right? You okay. started writing. Was it primarily writing? Did you do podcasting? Did you do what, what kind of content? Well, did you, you can't get on podcasts if nobody knows you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'd love to say, yeah, yeah. I did podcasts. Well, you could probably get on my podcast. I mean, that's, you know. <laughs> oh, so yeah, uh, you know, you can't do a podcast if nobody knows you. So I started out, I reached out to, you know, the, the top tier to mm -hmm. say, hey, can I write a blog post for you? Here's my here's what I'm going to write on, here are ideas, here's my credentials. Um, 
and did not, I just got crickets. So then I went down to like the next tier and it was still crickets. And then I went down to the next one. Like so I reached out to Dan Pope. I don't know if he works at Champion Sports, but Dan has an online fitness blog. If you haven't interviewed him, you should. He's an awesome, awesome guy. Yeah. Um, and he's like, yeah, write a blog post. I was like, finally, <laughs> somebody <laughs> answered my email. <laughs> so I wrote a guest blog post for him. And from there, I name dropped him to somebody else. I was like, oh, check out my blog post on his site. And then they're like, oh, okay. Well, you know, Dan Pope, I made sure they had a connection. Yeah. And you're know, like, oh, okay, yeah, write one for my site. And then I worked my way up. To where, you know, Shake Magazine called me for an interview because, you know, it, it, so it was not, I didn't start out with getting on these major sites. And um, so I just systematically kind of worked my way up, just like I would think about approaching any other challenge in life. You just, you come with a plan, you start at the bottom, you, yeah. you know, execute it, and then you're where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, and I mean, how many no's did you think you heard before you got a yes? <laughs> Well, I wrote, I think I wrote the editor of Teen Nation at least three to five times before he got back to me and said, yeah, we'd love that. Awesome. <laughs> I just ignored the nose and, and kept asking. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really powerful story. I mean, you know, I, um, now I don't, I don't have an issue getting guests generally. Um, that's <laughs> not, at first it was, you know, and you know, I sent out so many emails, so many Facebook messages because I didn't even have a show. It was just a dude with a computer and my little, you know, earbuds, my iPhone earbuds, and that's all I had. And, um, you know, I sent out so many emails and finally Dan John just replied back. And I was like, Oh, whoa, well, that's great. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, and he just said, Hey, you know, uh, he's so good. He's like, here's my cell phone. Call me tomorrow. I'm free in the afternoon. We'll schedule a time. And I was like, Oh my God. And that was it. And once you have someone like that, then you yeah. can say, hey, you know, here's a couple of Yep, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But you had to take the time to get, and that's how I met Kelly Davis. Mm -hmm. um, it was I probably sent out an email to 70 people looking to do a collaborative article, like best ab exercises or something, just to, just for some networking and they get word out on mm -hmm. good exercises and to create a fun blog post. And I, I had like eight people get back to me out of the 60 I sent it to, and she was one of them and we hit it off and developed a great relationship and then ended up networking and doing a product together. And then, I mean, you just never know what's going to come out of the putting yourself out there. I yeah. mean, no, doesn't hurt. No, it doesn't. But everyone's scared and scared shitless of it. You know, that's the funny thing. So it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, if I'm thinking about pursuing a sport, if I, if I don't get to failure, I never know where my limit is. You know, I mean, I've got to fail. Like I'm a I'm a rock climber now. I've done a lot of sports, but that's currently the one I'm pursuing. And if I'm not falling, I mean, I'm not I'm not climbing. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Same uh, thing with business. Yeah, that's a great message. So, okay, so you did a year of content. Now you're starting to get published. People are starting to find out a little bit about who you are. Now what? Now what did you do? I put a, I put my product together. I was like, okay, I've got it. And I, I did the most expensive Facebook ads on the face of the planet. <laughs> but I sold 10 copies. Oh, wow. And of those 10 women, I had like a support group, and they're all still with me. Um, it was very, it was very exciting and I helped all of them and they all have, I have testimonies from I think all of them on my website and I started well below what I wanted to charge, but I just needed to get the product out there. And that's hard because you're, you're looking at what you want to charge. And sometimes when you're first starting out, you need to get people in the door so that you can figure out your audience. So I interviewed, I called all 10 of those women. Mm -hmm. that, that, that answered the Facebook ads where I think they I paid two dollars a click or something. <laughs> yeah, good old days. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. they they clicked on it and they ended up following all the way through to purchase, which was exciting. Um, and then ended up talking to all of them and getting to know them, and I figured out who my target audience was. Not surprising. A type women, driven, want to pursue sports, had several kids, and I mean, it was like, okay, this is this is who I'm talking to. And and from there, I could actually talk to my audience because I knew I knew I had a product to help people. Mm -hmm. I just needed to figure out who I was speaking to. Yeah. And what was that product? It was the course? 
through now it was a pelvic floor it was a pelvic floor perfect program so it was a it was just a pelvic floor program for women who were like me who yeah. just felt like they didn't get answers and they were looking for something else okay so you put this program together it had like just work out like uh movement plans things like that well, like yeah, a lot of a lot of education, okay. a workout, um, you know, progressions and cool. um, a lot of exploration, you know, I, I do a lot of teaching and now I've completely redone the program three times, Okay, <laughs> which is how it is. I mean, don't get married to your first product. Right. <laughs> so it's right. good. I got back and I redid it and then I got more feedback and then I redid it again. And now I think I'm, I'm fairly happy with it. I don't know. I'll probably redo it again in a year, but um, just keep trying to make it better based on the needs of the feedback that I'm getting. Cool. So you have that avatar, right? Which you're selling the actual, so those are the people who actually have, you know, um, you know, they want to improve pelvic floor issues, right? And then you also have, you're educating now other professionals in, within well, the health industry. The thing is, is when I first started online, I was scared to have a voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been teaching continuing education courses in person since 2007. I taught my first continuing education course on the shoulder in 2007. I've been teaching in person for a long time, but putting yourself out there online is terrifying. And then being judged and teaching other professionals, it's even double terrifying. So it took me a while before I felt comfortable to be like, okay, I'm going to put out an online continuing education. I'm teaching this stuff in person. I've been teaching it in person for years. I mean, I was teaching an in-person pelvic floor doing an education class for at least two years before I put out a version online. So I had been, you know, testing it and running through it. And, um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, it's scary. <laughs> yeah. So with the fears that you had, you know, going into it, did, did that actually come to fruition? Like, did people actually attack you? Like, yeah. yeah everybody was like, Oh, this is great. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. sharing them. I've never yeah. looked at it this way. Wow. This is, this is different. This is, yeah. you know, this is, this is, this is interesting. And I was like, Oh, okay. Well, it's not that scary. People yeah. are actually nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you always have that one hater that comments on your blog, like, oh, I can't believe you would recommend people should deadlift. I'm like, dude, you just really blew everything out of proportion. Why you got to be that person? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but you're always going to have that person, right? Yeah. There's always going to be, it's a small percentage. And my, my thought is like, as soon as you get those, it's actually a sign of success. You know, as soon as someone's starting to criticize you, it means you've got to enough people or you've, you've reached that one jerk. Right? And you have an opinion. Yeah, because if you're always so careful all the time to make sure you you have it, you just you I think you lose a lot of your audience because you never stand for anything. Because I see lots of people online that are posting good stuff, but they're coming across kind of meek in their voice. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my writing is probably exaggerated for my opinion for how I would be in person. In person, I'm a little bit more laid back. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I don't know, it depends. I, I kind of feel that way. But in writing, I'm like, yes, this is how it is. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I feel like it, I needed a voice. I need to find a stronger voice to stand out because there's yeah. just a lot of noise. Yeah. So that's interesting too. So you found a voice and do you, and do you feel when you're writing, did you feel like you were taking on like a separate persona almost? Yeah. I go into the, um, I go into the person of, I'm not this kind of laid back professional person I'm this is I, I've got a patient in front of me they have an issue I'm trying to convince them of a treatment okay go yeah and so it's more of like the okay this is this is the person I have in mind this is the argument I need to use instead of the okay let's keep everybody happy because it's scary I mean I have lots of professionals that I'm friends with and they're more very comfortable giving one-on-one -on -one opinions mm -hmm. but they want to never put their opinion online and I'm like, you should, you should, you know, you should write that. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, come on, people need to hear this stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's hard to get, I think, especially women. Um, there's been several books uh, written about it. Like the confidence code is really good. If there's any women who are watching this, um, confidence code was great. It, it was just a bunch of studies. Um, and they looked at how women basically don't sit at the table. Women have to know, it was like, they have to know a third more than men to feel just as confident on a subject area. Wow. Yeah. Which is crazy. Which is that why when you look crazy. at the online space, yeah. especially physical therapy, you look at the online space. I mean, how many women physical therapists are there and how many women physical therapists are there online? I mean, honestly, you're the only one I know. There's like four guys in my class and 60 women. 
Mm -hmm. and there's like 90% males online and 10% women. That's wild. So let's, let's talk about like now we're, we're the things you've achieved. Yeah, and we digress. <laughs> yeah. Let's no, it's great. I, I, I think when I ask this question is not necessarily to impress people, but to impress upon people what's possible after you kind of stick to the plan for five years. Right. Yeah. yeah you stick to the plan. <laughs> yeah. Stick to the plan. Like what, like what is your lifestyle like now? Like what, how has the online business uh, changed your life? How, how is it? Yeah. Give us this is a hard question because I still work all the time. Yeah, okay. Well, you talk, <laughs> I don't you have like this, oh, yes, we were going to these tropical islands and I work two hours a day and Tim Ferriss is right. You only have to work four hours a week. So no, he lives. You have to work more than four hours a week. Yeah, yeah that's BS. It's totally BS. No, There's I'm, some great concepts in that book, but it's four hours. Yeah, it's BS. I'm so. pretty driven. So, um, so yeah, continuing to, continuing to work hard just because I love it. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, we have, we have extra income, which is great. We can do what we want to do. Things aren't tight. If I want to take extra continuing ed courses, I can do that. Um, if I want to spend more money, um, just, you know, working on things, it's, it's easy. Like life is good and, and it's worked. And I think there was another business podcast where he asked me about in person. Cause he said a lot of the business, um, trainers, he sees that want to go online their main income is in person yep. and their online is their side business. And I would say when I go in to see people, I do it because I love it and I learn when I'm in person, but I definitely lose money. Yeah. So if that puts it into perspective, um, yeah. so I still do one-on-one -on -one appointments because I mean, that's, that's where I learn. I mean, I, I spent a decade or more treating people and that's how I learned troubleshooting. And I feel like there's so many people that try to jump into the online space and they have no experience on real bodies. Yeah. They're like, oh, I got myself in shape. So now I'm going to create an online program. It's like, well, well you haven't troubleshooted that through 100 people. Mm -hmm. You know, how are you going to help these people? You have just one, you know, this one generic uh, plan. Anyway, I think getting experience on real people is very important and something I continue to do because I, I find a lot of value in it for going above and beyond online. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting because it's, um, you know, the images that people portray online are often different than what's actually going on, you know, and, um, see it all the time is, you know, I see people who I'm like, wow, you know, on the outside, they're super successful. And then I get on a phone call with them. They're like, yeah, it's like, dude, I think about quitting this online thing. It's just not paying. Well, off. and that's what, yeah, I talked to several, when I, when I actually started making connections, I have talked to these people that had huge online followings mm -hmm. and I was like, I have probably made 10 times more than they do with my, like small and long following, but you know what? I over delivered to every single person that bought my program. Yeah. And then they told people, and then my programs grew by grassroots instead of me putting all of this into social media. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? I post multiple videos a week to the people paying for my program, not online to my potential clients. Yeah. So I probably put 90% of my effort into the people that are paying me and 10% into growing my business. And that has come back, you know, tenfold. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I know you've been asked this question before. If you haven't, I'd be shocked. But, you know, if, if someone's listening, um, you know, let's say it's, you know, Susie Fit Pro or Susie, um, you know, Dr. Susie, right? Uh, what is in there like, you know, God, I'm, I'm really dying to get online. What the first step? Um, what is that? And then even taking one step further, because probably no one asked you what the second step is, right? So number one, what's the first step? And then what's what's the follow up to that? Yeah. So start your website, find your voice, start mm -hmm. writing, start doing some videos, start putting out content. You'll be horribly embarrassed by it a year later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I am. Don't look at my early YouTube channel. Don't do it. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, right. but, but yeah, just start putting yourself out there and get comfortable putting yourself out there. Cause then you can stand in front of a camera and you can be yourself uh, instead of being scared and you can write and get things across. And, and I think the second step is trusting that you're always going to come up with something better in the future. Isn't that the, isn't that the biggest question you get from people like, Oh, well, if I write that blog post, I'm not going to have, this is all my ideas. It's like, it's never all your ideas. Yeah. And if it is, you're in big trouble, but don't think that way. There's always more. I write what I think is the best article in the whole world. And then two weeks later, I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is an even better idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Just trust, like do your best work, do it every single day. Don't hold anything back and don't be afraid of, you know, that don't be afraid of running out of ideas. Ideas are plentiful. It's the follow through. that's so hard. 
Yeah. Well, the un- un- ideas are like, they never stop. Like mm-hmm. that's ideas can be actually quite troublesome if you have too many. Oh yeah. yeah. Chasing the wrong ones. And I think, you know, when I, I talk to a lot of people too about getting online and <clears throat> I know because I live it, you know, it's just spend a year just giving and go out there and just start producing content, giving things of value and just bear your head, just commit to that year, you know, plan whatever you need to do financially, right. To make that happen. Um, but just, you know, even Gary Vaynerchuk, right. I mean, he talks about all the time. He's like, you got to spend a full year eating shit. Right. Like just I don't know who he is. Who is he? Oh, oh Gary Vee? Oh, okay. okay. We'll talk about this after, but yeah, okay. most people in the online space probably know uh, Gary Vee. He's just, uh, he's one of the most famous uh, digital marketers out there. Um, and just a, a business guru nowadays. But yeah, he talks about, he's like, you know, you want to start building a personal brand. You want to start getting online. You're just going to mm-hmm. have to do it for a year, you know, start building yeah. you know, Instagram following, start building this and start getting out there, maybe just screwing up a lot. And, uh, you know, yeah. you will, yeah. that, that social capital will come back. The universe has a funny way of doing it, but too many times people quit after a month, you know, or two, you know, I see so many podcasts that have seven episodes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like a magic number. Like, oh, no one's listening. Of course you're not listening. Uh, nobody's listening. Nobody's listening in the first year. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it, the internet, the online space is so huge. I mean, you just named somebody who you think is like the person everybody knows. And I've never heard of him. Right. But right. I know who Evan Pagan is. I'm sure you know who he is. I know who, you know, you don't know who Evan Pagan is? No. See? Oh my gosh. Yeah. See, exactly. So that's yeah. what people get all worried about. The, oh, there's, you know, somebody's already doing this. It's like 200 people could do it. There's a yeah. lot of people in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what do you tell people about really narrowing? Like how narrow does your niche have to be? Right. I think at the beginning, it needs to be very, very narrow. Okay. Like you're, you're wanting to help tennis players with their backswing. Yes. I mean, just, you know, or just to like, how narrow can you go? Because then you can target. And then once you start getting momentum, then you can start broadening out and broadening out. But if you can, if you can really target, it doesn't have to be this giant search term on Google where there's, you know, 2 million people searching for it every month. You mm-hmm. know, you can find a thing where it's, where it's, you know, a thousand people searching for it. Yeah. But there's nobody else doing that one little specific niche. Yeah. And then you got those thousand people. Yeah. And from there you can grow. And I yeah. think that's really cool. It's don't underestimate the power of doing something very narrow in the beginning. Yeah. And that's a really important mindset. And I just, I'm so excited you brought up like a little bit of SEO there. Um, <clears throat> you know, the like, just get as narrow as you can, um, but do the research too. You know, that's a big thing. Is like, yeah. are people actually searching for this term? You know, yes. You, yeah. And if you got one person searching for it a month, yeah, probably don't write that blog post with that title. Yeah. But if you've got those thousand people, then yeah, that's a thousand people looking to read what you wrote that potentially leads into that niche down product that could mm-hmm. really offer some value. And then that's where those ideas start coming. And you're like, whoa, mind blown. I don't yeah. have enough time in the day to follow all these ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give whoever's listening to this, I'll give you a golden nugget because I was going to do this. And then I just realized I'm like, I don't have the time, you know, I'm too busy with everything else, but I'm like, okay, I really want to develop, you know, uh, cause I'm a water polo player. That was my background. I'm like, I want to develop, you know, a, uh, a strength and conditioning program for water polo players. So I started searching it and then I found the golden term. This is it. You guys, the golden term that had plenty of action on it, but very little competition was dry land training for swimmers. So if you develop that program and you market it correctly, um, you will find probably a very enthusiastic and open crowd. Um, and that's, that's how specific you can get. I could even get right into shoulder health for swimmers, right? Or even deeper into that. How you're niching down. Yeah. And then look at all the articles you could write that could lead into this really great product that could help this niche. Yeah. And you just have to think a little creatively and then do the research. Yep. And how much easier does your content get mm-hmm. when you have that narrow? Like, you know exactly who you're talking to, right? You know exactly the avatar in your mind um, mm-hmm. versus like having to sit down and be like, so broad. Like, what do I talk about today? Oh, I can help everybody with back pain. Yeah. That you're not getting anywhere with that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you probably can help everybody with back pain, yeah. but you're, you're not going to be able to on the online space. Yeah. And at another approach, what's that? At least not at first. Yeah. And another approach to take that is find a, 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 a tribe, right? That's very yeah. enthusiastic. I mean, you look at um, <clears throat> Kelly Starrett, 
Do you know that, that name? Yeah. So he, he got into CrossFit, right? When CrossFit was still, you know, just about to just boom. And he just carved out, you know, his niche there and started talking to a tribe of very enthusiastic people, you know, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> what, what do CrossFitters like to talk about? CrossFit. Right? Yeah. So he just found a particular tribe that's very, very vocal um, and he served them correctly. And then he just, you know, essentially, I mean, he's a very talented, great speaker, great salesman, all those things. It's a huge combination of his success, but he was able to also ride that groundswell, right? So there's a couple ways to, to approach it. Um, but uh, like I said, once you get online, there's so many ways to skin that cap um, that you can do it. So, so where, where do you think you're going to be in two years? Where do you see your business? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I necessarily, I guess I do look that far, but I try to focus as much as I can on the day to day, because if I dream a little too much, I don't get enough done. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I just, I want to continue building. I want to continue building courses. I want to continue building products to help people because I know how hard it is to get in and have regular appointments with physical therapists. And you know, if I can make things easy, I can help more people. Um, so yeah, that's my goal. Just continue to do what I'm doing and find more efficient, better ways to do it. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. Well, this is, um, I mean, I know I learned a lot, so, and this is, it was fun. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know I, if I've learned something, I, I'm guessing other people learn something because this is just what I talk about all day. So, um, and it's cool because, you know, there's so many, like you're a living, breathing application of, of principles that so many people talk about, you know, but I don't think when you started, these principles didn't exist you know, um, finding your core competency. We talk all the time. Number one, find your core competency. Number two, niche down really, really specifically three, Mm -hmm. get started, right? Like four, start scaling five, you know, data and analytics. Like that's our stages of online. And it's, you just did all that, you know, over a span of five years, which is incredible. I don't think you really, I I might've been able to do it faster. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so it's really cool to see that, you know, you probably unintentionally went through all of those stages and now you're just, you know, scaling in a big way. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for coming on and inspiring people. And thank you. I mean, you, you do, you have a great position because you're truly helping people and you're helping yourself and you're helping your family and, um, you're making an impact. So I think it's really awesome. It's great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Duvall. Hey, fitness fans, don't leave yet. It's your host, Eric Malzone, and I have a quick favor to ask. Actually, three favors. So, number one, if you're a fan of our show, I ask you to do something that takes under three minutes. Go to iTunes, please, and subscribe to our show. Please, please, please. It means so much to us. It's so important. And then give us a favorable review. We would really, really appreciate it. And uh, I can't tell you how much it means and helps us out. So, I know it takes two minutes of your day, and uh, it means a lot to us. So, please do that. Number two, go to our YouTube channel or Fitness Marketing Alliance and uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel there. Number three, if you like this episode or any of the episodes that we've released, share it on social. That's huge, that's a big deal for us and we put a lot of work into these episodes uh, trying to give you great actionable content uh, for the fitness industry, so that would mean a lot. And that's it. So we have some big plans coming up for this show. I'll be talking about that in the next couple episodes, but thank you so much for listening. It means so much. And uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I love to hear from everybody. Eric, E-R-I-C at fitnessmarketingalliance.com.